Before we begin, big thanks to Brandon Manita for the video idea, and to all of you for watching, liking, and commenting. Once demons are exorcised, they're gone for good. Right? That's what you'd be led to believe. Chris Scott surely thought so, as he witnessed the Karayo exorcism unfold. The dominance, the devastation, was absolute. But, well, sure, PinoClean can account for 99.9% .9 of what you want to get rid of, but that 0.1% hangs around. It gathers mates, builds an army in secret, then comes back with force. And sure enough, the one man left from that 2011 playing list had done exactly that. He stands almost exactly 10 years later, ball in hand, siren gone. The minor premiership rests on his boot with the very opponent that slayed his friends at his own mercy. He is poised to draw sweet, sweet revenge, a decade in the making. But how did we get here? How did this mess compete for glory? Who is this sole survivor of the Karayo exorcism? Well, to answer these questions, we have to trace the journey of two diametrically opposed teams who, in a crazy September, became heroes and villains. Geelong and Melbourne were in vastly different places a decade before. One was a team who'd gotten so close, so many times before breaking a drought and building an empire. The other was a perennial loser, a shadow of its former glories that almost got lost in a merger, and now had two 30 goal losses on its books. Geelong's new coach was a Brisbane hero who guided them to one of the great grand final comebacks. Melbourne's coach was sacked immediately after Melbourne's darkest hour. Their new coach was an almost complete novice who really didn't have a prayer. And right after that, they were dealt a cruel gut punch. Jim Steins, the club president and one of the D's favourite sons, lost a well-documented battle with cancer at the beginning of 2012. Melbourne had lost its heart and played like it. They lost their first nine games with two 100-point beltings. They scored two wins in three after that, including an upset win over the Bombers. But that was as good as it was going to get. Whether through poor drafting or player development, the club sank. Neild was sacked halfway through 2013, with a winning percentage of 15. Only four men have coached more games with a worse record. Three of them were at least good players and had that part of their legacy to fall back on while the other was stuck with a post-war sate side, the poor bastard. The Neild era, short as it was, had left the club as a rudderless laughing stock. They were forced to rummage through Adelaide's disposal bin for a caretaker, with the side only recording one win under his tenure and falling flat into last place. They needed a replacement with experience, and they found one. Boy, did they find one. Paul Ruse took the helm at Sydney after Rodney Rocket Ede took a big old dookie in their bed. And would you look at that, he broke the oldest active premiership drought within three years. Seems the perfect bloke for the Melbourne job, eh? He also had experience with succession plans, having birthed John Longmire's insanely successful career, and he planned to do the same at the D's. Ruse turned things around right from the start. He tore into the list, bringing in Daniel Cross, Bernie Vince, Don Tyson, Aidan Riley, and some old lady, and getting rid of some injury-prone stalwarts and a whole bunch of rubbish. They also had their best draft in years. Things were looking promising for 2014. Things would finally turn around. Then they received this news. No. No way. It... It couldn't happen again. What had they done to deserve this as a club, as a community, as people? The seven-year storm of Adelaide, where Bailey had plied the last of his trade, had sucked, yes. 
but at least portions of that were of their own making. But this, there was no legislating for it. You can't prevent cancer, you can't guarantee remission, and you can't see disasters coming. Five men in high-profile AFL roles had passed away in a 10-year span. Three of them were demons. But the demons that remained kept their charted course, and one of them took to the skies. Russell Robertson was a Tasmanian forward who took high-flying marks for the Ds. As the team fell apart at the end of the Danaher era, he was a rare bright spot until he retired after the 2009 season. It was fitting that the very next year, Dean Bailey drafted a Tasmanian forward who took high-flying marks for the Ds. Allow me to introduce you to Jeremy Howe. You may remember him as one of very few goal scorers on the day of the Corio exorcism, which perfectly fitted his character at Melbourne. The one shining light among an ocean of shit. These are all the nominations for Mark of the Week that he had over his D's tenure. Now, let's show every time the D's actually won a game during this time. Yep, every time you went to a Melbourne game, you were several times more likely to see the best Mark of the entire week than just a win, despite the fact that seeing the Mark of the Week was several thousand times less likely to happen. Melbourne were just that crap. But Jeremy Howe brought some entertainment value to a club that was less watchable than a relative's funeral, and the Demon Faithful loved him for it. Until he left. But we'll get to that. They played better, but still didn't fare too well in 2014. As it turned out though, that year's lack of results was the best thing that ever happened to them. They were panning for gold, and sure, they found a gem or two. And if they'd gone for broke and cashed them in by mounting a charge now, their returns would have been poor. Instead, they kept digging, and struck gold harder than they ever could have dreamt of. James Frawley was sick of being the best defender in the worst team. He wanted to win a premiership, so he moved to the Hawks, and did. The compensation pick Melbourne got for him was tied to their first round pick, so had they finished mid-table, a draft hand of picks 9 and 10 would have seen some handy prospects don red and blue. Instead, they finished second last, got picks 2 and 3, and recruited two players that would change history. Angus Brayshaw was an unlikely star, like actually he was. When he polled in the top three in the Brownlow one year, he wasn't even there to celebrate it because he wasn't invited. No one thought he had a chance to win, and he only lost out by a couple votes. The helmeted hero would prove a valuable asset to the demons as they rose. And the bloke they got with pick three? Well, we'll get to him later. They also hired the handy Alex Neil Bullen, and a guy who, and this is true, was tagged out of a juniors game by this. And yes, that is kind of funny. But by now though, the Demons fans were struggling to find the funny side of anything. They'd had enough misery, enough pain. But as the Premiership drought ticked over to half a century, the curse they were under gifted them the worst 50th birthday present imaginable. Broadbridge. Steins. Bailey. Now, Dadaher. The people they were losing weren't just bit part players or background figures just passing through. They were heart and soul icons. Guys who'd sacrificed everything through the worst times. And guys who, despite spending some time elsewhere, were intrinsically linked to the demons. And for the 50th anniversary of their last success, Long-suffering fans had to watch the author of their most recent chance of success degenerate in real time. The next year saw another steady but small rise, like a pensioner's dick trying to get down to business. I can't believe I wrote that. The demons, though, were anything but steady at the trade table. They lost their big entertainment draw card in Jeremy Howe for not a whole lot. They brought in Thomas Bug, which ended well. 
and failed to get players of high quality in with the traded picks that they received. Except one. Melbourne wanted to trade up in this draft to secure one of two players. The first was Callum Mills, but as he was essentially cordoned off by the ridiculous academy rules, they went for a small, interesting looking ginger who at the start of the season looked like he'd go undrafted. He was inconsistent. He was hardly a star athlete. He was a huge risk. But by god, that ginger was incredible. Unlike his midfield partner in Brayshaw, he would poll Brownlow votes in every season he played, and he'd poll well. In fact, after only 124 games, he's polling at a better rate than Robbie Flower and Jim Steins, both Brownlow winners for Melbourne. Even though he looks like a postmodern Cameron Ling, the man can play football. 2016 saw the first true highlight of the rebuild. The annual belting that Melbourne received from Collingwood on the Queen's birthday had gained a new significance as the footy world rallied behind a favourite son. But now, with a decent squad and a pre-match rally from the big man himself, the Demons played with spirit, with heart. They thrashed a competitive squad. They improved their win tally for the season. They brought in the experienced Jordan Lewis and Mitch Hibbert, Simon Goodwin took the reins, and even though they lost a raft of experience and drafted poorly, they still had enough about them to only just miss the 2017 finals. It didn't come without another scare, though. Their new live wire phenom, Jesse Hogan, was affected by the death of his father, and then, a month later, he himself was diagnosed with testicular cancer. For one dreadful, overwhelming moment, it looked like it was happening all over again. But thankfully his surgery was successful, but all this, combined with a late season collarbone injury, meant Goodwin had to drag Tom McDonald up forward, which left a big hole in Melbourne's defence. So they needed one more star down back to complete their ascent, and they found one. They paid Adelaide two first round picks, and paid Jake Lever a hell of a lot of cash. They also drafted key defender Harrison Petty as cover, plus Spargo and Fritch to help bolster that sputtering forward line. And that was the difference with the Ruse Goodwin recruiting way. Like, say I was cooking you dinner, you know, casually, no pressure, no obligations. Like, I mean, you know, I could see it's together, but you know, oh, no, 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 I'm getting, I'm getting sidetracked. Um, <laughs> so we're making dinner, and I'm the Neil Bailey era demons. So uh, what kind of ingredients shall we cook with? Ow! Mm, I like the look of this watermelon. Mmm, I like cheese. <laughs> Fucking shitty delivery. These gherkin rounds have performed quite well in entrees. Nothing in there. Mmm. And I know that you like ice cream. So, we've got ingredients I like, but what are we making again? Ah, oh, damn it. I can't make that with this. They were directionless, recruiting pure talent, but with no idea of the overall result they wanted to produce. The Ruse Goodwin era demons knew what they were making, and what it took to make it. So they used lower profile ingredients to prop up the main components and, in doing so, created a sumptuous dish. Captain, my captain. Sit down, Mr. Anderson. They also appointed this man as their skipper. Max Gorn had made his debut two months before the Corio exorcism, presented with the number 37 jersey by another Ruckman who began his career with that jersey number. He missed the whole of the next season with an ACL tear and struggled to keep his spot in the senior side thereafter. And then, 2016 came around. Gorn had finished the previous year strongly and carried his form across a full year. No longer hampered by injury, and now the main ruck after Steph Martin left, he led the league for hitouts. He won the Neil Danaher Trophy on that great day in 2016. 
he broke the record for hitouts to advantage and won all Australian honours in addition to the Coaches Award and the James McDonald Trophy and finished equal fourth in the AFLPA MVP with this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful man. His 2017 was hampered by injury, but the man who bled red and blue was rewarded with the captaincy. And in 2018, he led from the front and had his best season. He won that best and fairest. He broke 1,000 hitouts in style. He helped his team finally climb the mountain and they won the Premiership. The AFLX Premiership, that is, uh, an honour they shared with Adelaide and Brisbane that literally no one ever talks about. It was their first pre-season win since 1989 though, so... yay? It was the prelude to an insane year though. After a stumbling start, a streak of six dominant wins helped them to their best finish in 18 years. And guess who they played against in their first final since 2006? What's that old proverb about cats crossing your path? But Melbourne had very literally served their seven years of bad luck. They played a middling Geelong lineup off their feet. They faced another builder of empires and conquered them too. Then they took on the Eagles and they got destroyed. They were held goalless for the opening half and ended up downed by 11 goals. Right afterward, they lost their troubled young star Jesse Hogan, but they traded wisely, picking up Cade Cal... Uh, mm, yep, him, and Stephen May to allow McDonald to move permanently forward as a form of Hogan SPAC filler. The Melbourne Demons now looked set to challenge for a grand old high-flying flag. Instead, they ended up being dragged to the very depths of hell.